Hello. Um, what we're going to do is take a look at some slides about the somatosensory pathways. Um, and this is to complement um, the videos that I've made where you've been drawing the pathways. But I thought it would be useful to just go through some slides as well. First thing that's worth doing is just thinking about where within the spinal cord the sensory tracts are found. And the two major sensory tracts that we need to think about are the dorsal columns, which are in this purple colour here in the dorsal funiculus, and the spinothalamic tract in blue here, forming a kind of cap over the ventral horn. The third important pathway we need to consider is this Lizauer's tract, um, which occupies this small position here at the tip of the dorsal horns. And Lizauer's tract is, is a small pathway enabling first order axons to ascend a couple of segments before synapsing. Now, as I state at the bottom of this slide, You've always got to remember that if we depict something on one side in the spinal cord, it is present on the other side as well. So you've got to always be using a, a, what I call a mental mirror. So here we're looking just at the dorsal columns on one side, but remember that the dorsal columns are present on this side as well. It just so happens that this figure is organized generally that the sensory pathways are on the left hand side and the motor pathways are on the right. Always apply that mental mirror. Lizauer's tract, even though it's involved in the sensory pathways, seems to be um, aberrant in that it's been lumped with the motor pathways. So dorsal column in the dorsal funiculus, spinothalamic tract in the um, ventral slash lateral funiculus. So let's think about the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway first. Um, and it, this is its full name, the dorsal column medial lemniscus, as we shall see shortly. It's actually a combination of two, indeed three separate pathways, reflecting the three orders of sensory neurons. The dorsal column pathway carries these modalities, uh, light touch, joint position sense, i.e. proprioception, vibration and two-point discrimination. And it is found, the dorsal columns at least are found in the dorsal funiculus here. So let's take a look at this um, diagrammatic representation of the entire central nervous system, the brain, the brain stem and the spinal cord. <clears throat> and if we start off thinking about a primary sensory neuron, maybe detecting light touch in the lower limb here, for example, we see that, <coughs> excuse me, the cell body of this primary sensory neuron, like all primary sensory neurons, is found within the dorsal root ganglia. Um, and it enters the spinal cord through the dorsal root and ascends ipsilaterally on the same side all the way up to the medulla. If we look at a projection running from the upper limb, we can see here it is a sensory neuron supplying the hand in this case. Once again, its cell body is in the DRG and it ascends ipsilaterally once more up to the medulla. Now, the target within the medulla of these dorsal column neurons, the target is one of two nuclei. If you are from the lower half of the body, from a level below T6, for example, you synapse in the gracile nucleus, which is medial. If you are from the upper half of the body, from above the T6 level, excluding the face, then you synapse in the cuneate nucleus. Having synapsed in the gracile or cuneate nucleus, these uh, second, the second order neurons then cross the midline and ace, send axons up towards the thalamus. So remember from the laws of the sensory system that it is the second order neuron that crosses the midline and they cross in what are called the internal arcuate fibers, which isn't shown very well on this diagram, but these fibers loop back on themselves like this and then ascend up 
to the thalamus. This pathway running from the dorsal column nuclei up to the thalamus is called the medial lemniscus. Hence why the whole system is called the dorsal column medial lemniscus system. So they are sent up to the thalamus where they synapse on third order neurons which go from the thalamus ultimately to the primary sensory cortex. Now the topography of this system um, is quite nicely uh, laid out in that in the dorsal columns the lower half of the body is represented most medially whilst the upper half of the body is represented most laterally. And the rationale for this is that the axons are added on to sequentially lateral parts of the dorsal column pathway as we go up through the body. I want you to ignore the pathway relating to the face here that is not relevant to our studies at the moment um, and we're not going to cover this in detail in the rest of the unit. Now because the dorsal column runs ipsilateral to the side of the body that it serves, what that means is that if we have um, an isolated lesion of the dorsal column pathway in one half of the cord, we would get ipsilateral signs below that lesion. All right. So damage to the dorsal column results in ipsilateral sensory loss below the level of the lesion. And that kind of pattern is very important for you to appreciate. So that's the dorsal column medial lemniscus pathway. Now let's take a look at the second major somatosensory pathway. <clears throat> and this is the spinothalamic pathway. Now the spinothalamic pathway is found, as we said, in the uh, ventral, but more the lateral uh, funiculus of the spinal cord, forming a kind of cap over the ventral horn. In fact, it, another name for this is the anterolateral system, due to the fact that it's present in the anterior and lateral funiculi. Now, the spinothalamic system carries the modalities of pain, uh, temperature, and crude touch. And compared to the dorsal column system, the spinothalamic system actually carries the modalities which are crucial for the preservation of life. Okay? So, thinking about it, you want to be able to avoid pain to, to stay alive and you don't want to expose yourself to extremes of temperature. So that is why the um, dorsal, the uh, spinothalamic pathway is so important in keeping us alive. So let's follow the course of the spinothalamic pathway up through the cord. Here is a first order sensory neuron collecting information from one of the dermatomes in the lower limb. As with most of these, its cell body is in the dorsal root ganglion and it projects into the ipsilateral half of the cord onto the second order neuron, which is found within the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. It is the second order neuron that decussates, and we see it crossing the midline here, and then ascending all the way up to the thalamus in the spinothalamic tract. Now let's take a, take a look at a primary sensory neuron from the upper lip. Once again, it collects information from a dermatom in the upper limb. Its cell body is in a dorsal root ganglion. It projects ipsilaterally to the cord. Onto a second order neuron within the dorsal horn. That second order neuron is the one that decussates. So its axon crosses the midline and then it ascends up to the thalamus. Once the spinothalamic tract has ascended up to the thalamus, its synapses on second order neuro, uh, third order neurons sorry, within the thalamus, which then project to the respective areas of the primary sensory cortex. Now, there's a key difference between the spinothalamic pathway and the dorsal column pathway. And this difference is brought about by the decussation um, in the cord. Remember that in the dorsal column pathway, as we move higher up through the body, fibres are added on laterally, so that the lower half of the body was represented most medially in the dorsal column pathway.
This is inverted in the spinothalamic pathway, so that the lower half of the body is added is, is represented most laterally in the pathway, and then successively higher levels get added on to the medial aspect of the tract. This is just a direct consequence of the fact that we, we have a decussation within the cord itself. Now, if we have an isolated lesion of the spinothalamic tract, for example, here, that would lead to loss of spinothalamic modalities below the lesion, but on the contralateral side, due to the crossing over of fibres within the cord. So that's a key difference between the spinothalamic tract and the dorsal columns. Dorsal columns lead to ipsilateral features, spinothalamic tract damage leads to contralateral Now we've talked about this but I thought it would be useful for us to recap the somatotopic organization and the topographical organization of these two sensory pathways. So here the dorsal column is in green and we can see that the lower half of the body, so we've got the lumbar and sacral dermatomes, are represented most medially whilst the upper half of the body, the cervical dermatomes, are represented most laterally. So lower half of the body is most medial in the dorsal columns, upper half of the body is most laterally. And we can see that this is the opposite of what is seen in the spinothalamic pathway, in that the deepest layers of the spinothalamic pathway, corresponding to the medial portion of the dorsal columns, are representing the cervical levels, whereas the most superficial layers of the spinothalamic pathway um, correspond to the lumbar and sacral levels. Don't worry about this segregation into different modalities. For our purposes, we are treating all of these together. So don't worry about this segregation into different modalities within the uh, anterolateral or spinothalamic system. So you can imagine that knowledge of the um, somatotopic organization of these tracts can be very useful if we're trying to localize a lesion. Let's imagine a lesion. Uh, let's put a lesion on here. Um, so let's imagine a central cord lesion here, which is growing like this. Okay, You can imagine that as this lesion grows, it will initially hit the medial most portions of the dorsal column. So uh, we might lose proprioception in the lower limbs because they're uh, supplied by these lumbar and sacral dermatomes. Then, as this thing continues to grow, it'll start hitting the spinothalamic tract. And something interesting will happen there. If this lesion were up at the level of the neck, then what we might see is that we might have lost, say, proprioception in the lower limbs. And we might have lost pain and temperature in the upper limbs due to involvement of the cervical level. So we can get what's called a dissociated sensory loss, whereby we have um, different patterns within different limbs with different modalities being affected. Uh, and that kind of dissociated sensory loss um, could be indicative, say, of a central cord lesion or one half of the cord being affected. Staying on the theme of lesions, let's have a think about, um, in more detail, the consequences of trauma and vascular lesions affecting the, the, the uh, cord itself. And the main message I want to get across to you in this slide is actually, when we're thinking about spinal cord lesions, we tend to emphasize the effect on the white matter, on the long tracts within the cord. We need to also remember that the grey matter can also be damaged as well. So both can be damaged and both can lead to um, a variety of consequences. So let's start off by thinking about a classic uh, lesion in neuroanatomy, and that is a complete cord hemisection. All right. So what I want you to imagine is that we have got a lesion, an idealized lesion, of course, we have a lesion which has destroyed 
the left half of the spinal cord, one half of the spinal cord, and it's destroyed half of an entire segment. Okay, so it might have destroyed, say, the left half of the T6 spinal cord segment. So let's think about um, what has been destroyed by this red lesion. So it's shown here in the 3D view, and it's shown here in the transverse section. So what's been destroyed? Well, the dorsal horn has been destroyed. So there's the dorsal horn on one side. That's gone. So has the ventral horn. So the dorsal horn and the ventral horn have been destroyed. The other areas of cord grey matter have also been destroyed. So if this is a thoracic level, which in fact this is, the lateral horn has been destroyed. Remember, that's important for the sympathetic system. And on that half of the cord, all white matter pathways have been destroyed, as well as the dorsal and ventral roots. All right. So just to recap, this lesion destroying one half of a spinal cord segment would destroy the dorsal horn, the ventral horn, other areas of cord grey matter on that side, all of the white matter on that side, as well as the dorsal and ventral roots. So this lesion will have a number of quite wide-ranging consequences. First of all, we would get ipsilateral. So on the same side, we would get ipsilateral complete segmental anesthesia affecting a single dermatome. So the dermatome that this spinal nerve supplies would be completely anesthetic due to the fact that we have destroyed the input into this spinal cord segment as well as having destroyed the dorsal horn. So this, the sole dermatome supplied by this spinal nerve would be rendered completely anesthetic to all modalities, both spinothalamic and dorsal column modalities. Secondly, we would lose, ip ipsilaterally, we would lose dorsal column modalities below the lesion. Why would we lose the dorsal column modalities ipsilaterally because the dorsal columns run along the ipsilateral side of the cord to the side of the body that they supply and below the lesion because we've interrupted those dorsal column fibers you know it doesn't take a big wide lesion to completely interrupt a tract just a single knife cut would completely interrupt any tract that the knife cut through Next, we would have contralateral loss of spinothalamic modalities below the lesion. Why should that be? Well, the spinothalamic tract sits here, so here on the transverse section. And remember that this is composed of the second order axons, which had already decussated at the level of the cord, um, at which their first order neuron entered, and they came in below. So this contains information coming from the contralateral half of the body below the lesion. Now there's something important that we need to appreciate. And this is the idea that the sensory level, that is the lowest level of normal function for spinothalamic modalities, may be lower than for dorsal column modalities. And this is all a direct consequence of this Lizauer's tract. Okay, Lizauer's tract, which is found here within the spinal cord, like forming a cap on the dorsal horn. Lizauer's tract is a small pathway which enables first order sensory neurons to ascend a couple of segments before they synapse upon um, their second order neurons. Now, this will take a little bit of thinking on your part to get your head around, but, but I'll try and make it as simple as I can by drawing a little diagram. So here I'm drawing the spinal cord longitudinally here. Okay, And here is the midline. We must always get into the habit of uh, drawing the midline onto our diagrams. And here is our lesion. So I'm going to put a lesion and this, you know, thinking about this Lizauer's tract only really works if we just think of a hemisection a lesion of one half of the cord like we've been talking about here. Now, if I just change colour, in uh, blue, here is a dorsal column 
axon pace ending up and you can see that it gets to the lesion and then it becomes interrupted so this is this explains why we have locked um, the dorsal column modalities ipsilateral to the lesion now let's think a little bit about the uh, spinothalamic pathway now the spinothalamic pathway and i'll just change the color uh, let's go for green so the spinothalamic pathway remember here we've got a first order sensory neuron comes in it synapses on a second order neuron which crosses the midline and then ascends in the spinothalamic tract now if it were if we didn't have lizauer's tract we would have complete loss of spinothalamic modalities below the level of this lesion as well. However, what Lizauer's tract allows is this. So here is our um, first order neuron. But actually, what this axon can do is it can ascend to a level that puts it above the lesion. And then it can synapse on a second order neuron, which can cross the midline and then they send up towards the brain. So this Lizauer's tract here is present at all levels of the spinal cord, and it enables these first order neurons to ascend a couple of segments before synapsing on a second order neuron. Now in reality, these first order neurons are doing all sorts of things. Some of them are synapsing immediately, some of them are sending their branches upwards, and through Lizauer's tract, some of them, and you don't need to worry about this, are even descending a few levels as well. But essentially, Lizauer's tract helps us to understand why the sensory level for spinothalamic modalities is in fact lower than the sensory level for dorsal column modalities in most patients. Now, this relatively difficult concept um, is part of a syndrome known as brown saccard syndrome okay brown saccard syndrome um, and <clears throat> it's one of those syndromes which kind of doesn't really exist in its purest form in real patients however it is as i've said here beloved of neuroanatomists because we like to ask you questions on it because it is an excellent test of whether you understand how the spinal cord is wired up so this is really important for you to grasp Right, now finally, um, I just want to make a few comments about um, the descending control of pain. You may have studied this in your health psychology and talked about it as, for example, the gate control theory of pain. And essentially what we're talking about here is the way in which we might modulate the strength of transmission between first and second order sensory neurons within the pain system. Now, I don't expect you to know a great deal about the various um, fiber types of first order neuron, but in order to understand this, we do need to invoke two different varieties. The first type of uh, sensory neuron that we need to think about are the so-called, those which have the so-called A fibers which are those that carry impulses from mechanoreceptors in the skin. These are large, relatively fast conducting fibers. The second type we need to appreciate are the C fibers, which carry pain signals. These are nociceptors. So if we think about a C fiber, which is a nociceptor, it carries pain information along here. Uh, and essentially what it does is it synapses upon a second order neuron, which will form the spinothalamic tract and then go all the way up to the brain, enabling us to feel pain. Don't worry about the different transmitters here, just appreciate that blue neurons are excitatory, whereas the black neuron is inhibitory. Now, we've all experienced a common phenomenon, and that is that if we've hurt ourselves, we note that if we rub the painful area, that can actually help the pain, that can alleviate the pain to a certain extent. This comes about by the fact that the A fibers synapse onto inhibitory interneurons, which then 
are able to inhibit the second order sensory neuro, which will go up to the thalamus. So by rubbing on this painful area, through these inhibitory neurons, we can inhibit pain transmission. And this is very, very important um, because um, not, it's not just the fact that rubbing a painful area helps, but knowledge of this pathway has enabled us to make a number of drugs which modulate the activity of these inhibitory interneurons. The best example of this um, is the opiates. Now, before we finish, there's one more important thing I want to point out. Not only do these inhibitory interneurons receive input from A fibers from the mechanoreceptors, but they also receive quite profuse inputs from the brainstem, and particularly from a part of the brainstem known as the reticular formation. This reticular formation um, has many, many roles, and one of these roles is the regulation of pain transmission. One thing that we do know is that there are certain psychological states which can alter the way that we perceive pain. For example, um, we know that if we reassure a patient that this, this isn't going to hurt, the patient does tend to experience less pain than if we say this is actually really going to hurt. That's the basis of the placebo and the nocebo effects. Also, we've heard uh, of a number of stories of people who have undergone terrible traumatic injuries, but reported feeling remarkably little pain. And all this is based upon these descending pain modulatory pathways, which in extreme psychological circumstances can become strongly activated, leading to strong inhibition of these spinothalamic neurons uh, and actually closing the pain gate, meaning that these patients haven't felt as much pain as you might imagine. So that's all I've got to talk about uh, on this topic. Thanks for listening.